Right. Well, without further ado, we'll, we'll make a start. So welcome everyone to this Cafe Sci event. Um, I'm, I'm glad you could all join us this evening. Uh, we are welcomed tonight by uh, uh, Dr. Chris Smart from the University of Exeter. So Chris works as part of the uh, Understanding Landscapes project. And he's here to talk to us tonight and uh, answer our questions about a fantastic uh, community involved LIDAR investigation project that has been underway um, in this county and beyond. Um, so yeah, I dare not introduce you any further, Chris, uh, over to yourself. Thank okay. you. Thanks for that. Right, I'll first of all share my screen. So, um, so my, name, my name is Chris Smart. Um, I'm an archaeologist based in uh, Exeter University, based in the Exeter campus. Um, but I actually live and work um, in the Tamar Valley, so the river that divides Devon and Cornwall. Um, so uh, what I will discuss tonight actually uh, straddles the border between the two, two counties, which in itself uh, can prove uh, pro problematic. I want to very much frame this um, in the sense that it is, has been a reaction um, to the past 12 months um, that we've all experienced, and it is something that was never envisaged as part of the project which I run. The project is called Understanding Landscapes, and it's a heritage fund uh, project um, we've been running now for uh, about two and a half years, and so we had a one and a half years of uh, very active work, and then we, we um, got hit quite heavily by COVID simply because of the nature of the work um, that we do. I'll come on to that a little bit more um, in, in a second, but I just thought the, the first thing I should really say is that the, the, the outline of the talk this evening will just be to review um, some of the initial findings of, of a scheme using uh, LIDAR data. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, I'm sure pretty much everybody now has heard in, in somewhere in the, of LIDAR, light detection and ranging. Um, essentially a remote sensing technique which uses a sensor fixed to an aerial platform in our case, um, more often than not um, a, a, a fixed wing plane, uh, elsewhere um, helicopters are used and even drones, uh, but the data we're using is all cap captured using fixed wing planes with a LIDAR sensor beneath. Essentially the sensor sends out um, uh, near infrared pulses uh, to the ground um, and that, that uh, laser pulse is reflected back up to the sensor and essentially measures elevation um, at a given point and the given points are recorded because there's a um, differential GPS tracking system uh, within, within the, uh, the plane and, and, and is linked to the sensor. So all of the points uh, which are fired from the aircraft and from, from the sensor has a, has a three dimensional uh, position and is also recording elevation based on the return of the LIDAR pulse. Um, to bounce off the the, uh, the surface which it reflects back to the sensor. Um, just a little bit about the, the technique. I, I confess to Connor that I, I, I'm not um, a technical wizard in LIDAR. I'm very much an end user and my colleague Joao Fonte, a researcher at Exeter, is very much the, the, the brains behind the data uh, manipulation which I'll present. I very much bring the archaeological side of the project. When um, the laser pulse um, is sent down from the, the sensor on the aircraft, it essentially reflects off the first thing that it hits. Now that may be uh, the surface of a roof of a building, it may be the uh, tree canopy, it may make it all the way down to the ground surface if there's no vegetation. Laser pulses of a certain size, in fact, um, it may be that a single pulse will have uh, a number of reflections based on uh, what it's passing through, what it's reflecting off. Um, and we usually refer to uh, four returns for the data that we're looking at in the way that the data is processed. So the image on the top right here um, shows you essentially what I mean. So the, the first returns, are essentially those that are bouncing off the highest things that are in the landscape. In an urban environment, that'll be high rise buildings, the roofs of those. Uh, in a countryside setting, that'll be the tree canopy. So the first return is essentially mapping the form and the shape of the tree canopy. The second return, those, um, those uh, pulses that actually get a little bit further, maybe hitting the shrub vegetation canopy, the third return some, some of them as well. And it's only the fourth return that is actually the, uh, the surface of the land. So those areas where a laser pulse is able to get through 
tree canopy, the shrub vegetation, and actually hit and reflect off of the, the ground surface. Once that data is collected, essentially model it um, in a number of ways, we can create a digital surface model, which is essentially a reflection of all returns. So the bottom left image here is the digital surface model, and you can see um, that that essentially represents the bare naked earth where there's no vegetation, but more often than not in that image, um, is essentially mapping the surface of the tree cut. So the, um, you're not actually able to see um, all of the, the terrain, uh, beneath that tree cover simply because we're only looking at, we're looking at all returns, including the vegetation. The data um, can actually be uh, manipulated modeled and strip away those um, early returns, the first, second, third, to leave us with the fourth returns, um, which gives us this bare earth model, a digital terrain model, so it strips away the vegetation canopy. Um, the higher the resolution of the data capture, the better, um, the, the obviously the denser the vegetation um, and leaf cover on trees, the fewer points will get through to the ground, which means it will end up with low resolution in high density vegetation. So the optimal time of flying uh, for LIDAR for archaeological purposes, so essentially seeing beneath vegetation, is when uh, there's as little tree cover as possible, a little leaf cover as possible. So the project in which I run, Understanding Landscapes, um, essentially is, an, is a community-led, community-focused archaeological project, um, of which one big element um, is the exploration of a Roman fort at Calstock in the heart of the Tamar Valley um, and its environs. So we work with members of the public to excavate in and around the fort um, annually. Um, we conduct geophysical surveys for purposes of archaeological mapping. Um, other elements such as desk-based desk um, map analysis, uh, looking at how the landscape has changed over time. Uh, the image in the top left here, I can use my pointer, is a, is a magnetic geophysical survey captured over various years, um, which you may be able to make out the, the dark lines here are essentially represent things dug into the ground and backfilled with, with sediments. And the two straight lines that describe the lower half of a square are actually uh, Roman fort uh, defences, they're the ditches, and the, the various straight lines you can see within the footprint of this are actually the buildings within the, uh, the fort. They're the footings for timber, timber constructions, the barracks, um, et cetera. Um, this was found in uh, the late 2000s. Myself and a colleague were um, doing some survey work looking for a medieval silver smelting centre, uh, but it turned up a, a very unexpected a bonus in, in the sense of a, a previously unknown Roman fort, probably housed around about five, a garrison of 500 soldiers, lasted for about 30 years between circa 50 AD and, and 80 AD. But some interesting themes that this has thrown up, um, such as uh, we know that there's a marching camp on the site. It's very hard to see perhaps in the image that you can see, but here underlying the fort is actually a uh, an earlier marching camp, so we know the army are here uh, already, they're uh, moving through the landscape before they then create this a more permanent timber built fort. There's also a large ditched enclosure that surrounds the fort, and um, we've excavated that on two occasions um, and have a conflicting uh, archaeological narrative, which is um, lots of Roman military period pottery of the mid first century, but radiocarbon dates of charcoal within it, which span uh, both the uh, pre Roman Iron Age and into the second century AD. So it is possible that the larger enclosure has an alternative origin um, and, and is manipulated during the Roman present. The themes that I'm going to talk about um, very or highlight very briefly and, and not so much the results because it's very much an ongoing process um, with our LIDAR program, but some themes that are coming out of it. And the themes uh, that are really important is how um, the Roman army move into this region how they interact with the existing populations and at what point and what time they're doing this. Um, the little group of coins illustrated on the bottom right are known as the Robra Horde. And uh, these are an unusual group of coins found uh, just on the uh, east side of the River Pavey. And they're very fresh Claudian mints. So these are coins that are minted um, just on the eve of the Roman invasion. And the lack of wear on them suggests that they've been deposited um, in the sort of the southwest Devon uh, countryside, very early on in the Roman uh, invasion and Roman conquest, um, 
perhaps certainly predating um, the creation of this permanent court at Calstock, the Roman legionary court at, at Exeter, for example, and whether there is a question about whether these coins represent military scouting far ahead of the advancing legion, and they could be deposited by uh, the late quarters. Uh, so there is this question that we're looking at now using our LIDAR data is what is the broader narrative for the Roman invasion across the southwest? COVID obviously prevented us um, doing a lot of our public facing work, so no excavations, no surveys, so in March everything had to stop and we wanted to find a way to keep engaging with our network of volunteers and in fact um, attracted quite a few new ones with this scheme. Um, we had LIDAR data available for the Southwest um, from various agencies, um, and we thought it would be um, a fun and interesting thing to see um, whether we could further some of our academic questions relating to the Roman uh, movement into the Southwest, the invasion, using uh, LIDAR data, basically looking at the new archaeological sites or elements of known archaeological sites that perhaps haven't been realised because no one has systematically looked at LIDAR data. So the, the central image is um, of a grid overlaying uh, the, the River Tamar. The River Tamar stretches north-south. So um, I actually live in the heart of this area and we defined a, a broad study area that essentially covered part of Bodmin. I went to the east as far as Dartmoor and then from Plymouth Sound all the way up to the north, the north coast. So we were doing a far-reaching um, intensive exploration of, of LIDAR data with a view to filling in some of the blanks on these uh, published distribution maps. And these are the distribution maps of supposed Iron Age, uh, late prehistoric settlement uh, in Cornwall. So that our study area is essentially to the right-hand side of the line that I'm marking there, and to the left-hand side on the Devon map. Filling in, seeing if we could fill in some of these blanks, how populated were these prehistoric landscapes prior to the arrival uh, of the Legion. So we've so far covered about 60% of that study area. Um, it's a Royal We, and there's a team of about a dozen volunteers regularly reviewing data, systematically mapping it as historic England would. We, we're very much trying to uh, approach this on a professional basis. So the mapping is as comprehensive as it can be, and it's recording everything from lost late medieval field boundaries, uh, 19th, 19th, 18th, 19th century quarries, back to the period that we're interested in through the lost and shrunken medieval settlements back into um, prehistoric enclosed settlements. So I just want to present the five slides, which are a number of themes. And I won't really go into any great detail. Um, hopefully some of the questions that may come will allow us to explore some of the, the detail. So the maps that I just showed you essentially represent the known pattern of prehistoric settlements. So in our study areas so far, bearing in mind we're about I think that's as I said, 60 to 70% through, we've identified 38 new probable prehistoric settlements and their form suggests that they are late prehistoric and probably Iron Age in date. Some of them may continue in use um, into the Roman period um, and even beyond, we do have some excavated examples um, where we know occupation of these sites is actually very uh, uh, stretched over a long period from the Iron Age all the way through to the early medieval period. So just a few examples of the sorts of things we're seeing. Um, Grayscale images of what, what you are seeing. Um, field boundaries that are extant today, um, you can make out. But the things that we're interested in are these muted, um, more gentle relief um, archaeological earthworks. So this, the light band here represents an upstanding earthwork and the dark band is a negative earthwork, meaning a bank um, and an associated ditch. And on the ground, although this shows quite clearly on the LIDAR image, you probably struggle to see it on the ground, such as the resolution and the capability of this LIDAR um, data. So typically we're looking at ovoid um, and round enclosed settlement sites, um, all as you can see of a similar form, and all of these are of the same scale. Um, so we're looking at sites that may be uh, 40 to 50 metres across up to 160 meters or so in diameter and a nice reconstruction that popped up on a, a, a West Penwith Landscape Partnership project Facebook page recently and I thought was a nice illustration of what this may have been like um, either earthen or rubble uh, banks enclosing um, a so 
as I say, we've identified so far 38 new new sites, but, it, but in addition, we've added additional elements to a further 17. So in this example on the bottom left, the, um, the inner round here, as they're known in archaeological circles, the inner round, that, that wasn't meant to be a pun, the, the inner element of this site is already known, but as you can see, the LIDAR is actually depicting a broader circuit. So we're adding new elements to some of these sites. So we're um, expanding the population of late Iron Age and, and Roman uh, Devon and Cornwall using this technique. A second theme and one which is really pertinent to, to my academic work um, is the movement of, of the Roman army and therefore how roads um, relate to known fortifications. Bottom left here, um, two squares visible on the LIDAR, and this is a, a permanent um, auxiliary fort at Restormal above the River Foy. Um, has been known now since metal detecting and geophysical survey was done in the mid 2000s. Um, what hadn't been realized um, when you take a wider view and look at LIDAR is that there's a linear feature to the east on the other side of the river, which is demarked by uh, lines of pits, so they're the black, uh, the black dots are essentially holes in the ground or the remnants of holes in the ground and corresponding lighter linear anomalies, meaning an upstanding way of work, um, or the agar of a road. So what we're seeing is quarry pits um, to extract material to build um, a road and we can see this going further to the northwest. I've put um, Roman roads in inverted commas simply because without excavation, we can't say for certain they are Roman, but they do seem to predate some of the enclosed medieval field patterns um, and, and clear medieval roads and routeways. So the fact that this heads directly to the opposite side of the river um, and heads um, towards, uh, it heads to the northwest and then uh, northeast and then runs east towards Calstock, which is where we've got the other fort strongly suggests that this is a Roman road line. And during the programme of work that we're currently doing, we so far max, mapped 76 kilometres um, across Devon and Cornwall of road of this type or earthworks of this type, which we're suggesting are part of a Roman road network. Including to the north side of Bodmin, where this image actually shows very, very well, um, this idea of quarry pits flanking an embanked earthwork, and this is the, the road surface, is the net, the, the, um, the lighter band here with the quarry pits either side, cutting across the countryside. You can see it probably very heavily degraded through medieval agriculture here, heading through, and then nice straight lines in the southwest. Again, we have to test these things um, archaeologically, excavate them, and see if we can uh, get some dating evidence to prove the fact that they're Roman. But we are working on the basis that these are likely to be pre-medieval routeways and their form and construction very much looked of a Roman form. The big question I have, however, is are these associated with the military conquest phase or are they a later phase? Are they moving from the late first century onwards into the second, third, fourth centuries, i.e. are they civilian infrastructure? Um, this map shows in red, the lines of the Roman roads, the Roman road segments that we've identified during this program, including some a little further over in West Somerset, in relation to Roman military installations as the black dots and the river network. Um, the blue dashed line is, in fact, uh, the pre previously suggested route of the Roman road. So all these are new. The segment here in the centre leading um, east from North Taunton and then south. Uh, West down to Oakhampton was actually recently published by a colleague of mine, John Salvatore. So this has been tested on the ground. The other elements are simply LIDAR anomalies. You can see that actually they, they tend to move through um, similar areas to where we're finding Roman military installations, but there are some places, um, particularly in, in North Devon, where we've got Roman military installations, but no sign of these earthworks. So the question is whether these, some of these roads actually develop later. Certainly the Roman legions and the march won't be constructing well with roads. And if anything, this is the, the roads are um, a product of this stabilization phase when we're seeing the building of permanent forts and not that um, stage where we're seeing marching here. Some of the Roman military installations, the form of a square fort, a, a playing card shaped fort, a square fort here, um, all very typical. Um, the fort of Calstock is square in plan. 
the thing that the LIDAR is now allowing us to see now, as well as some targeted geophysical surveys at a number of these locations, is that actually the, the ports, and, ports themselves aren't the only element of the story. Um, here at Lapford, for example, there's a much larger enclosed space. Um, at Calstock, we've got this archaeologically attested feature um, where Joao, my colleague, and I are doing some survey presently at, um, in North Devon. Uh, we can see monumental scale buildings outside of the defended enclosure and the suggestions of additional defensive ranges in further ditches to the north as if there is a larger enclosed space surrounding the port. Now, ports are known to have annexes, but these don't seem to function or be formed like an annex. They're full enclosure surface. And one of the suggestions could be that actually some of these sites take on a new role um, and actually become administrative centres for the, ci the civil uh, phase of occupation. So they begin life as a permanent garrison, but then go on to serve a function in the civil period, so post the military phase. Um, so it may be that the roads um, are associated with that phase as well. Another theme that's coming out through the uh, review of the LIDAR data is actually just how little we know about the Iron Age hill forts of the region, um, particularly their scale. Um, one of my questions that I'm kind of trying to answer at present is, well, are the roads moving into areas where there's evidence for substantial fortifications? Is it, is it a way of communicating and linking with these populous places um, if from the late Iron Age? One thing we don't know is how many are actually occupied right up until the end of the Iron Age and into the Roman period, whether these are abandoned before the uh, arrival of the army at all. So these are some hypothetical questions. Um, a cluster of sites um, near the sort of southwest end of where we've got the road network to, I think Harrow Rounds, Hall Rings and St Mons and Largan Castle. And actually this site here in Woodland at Largan Castle sits adjacent to the uh, one stretch of the road that I showed that comes from the Stormwood, which can be seen in the LIDAR here. So the feature that we're noticing at multiple sites now is that the documented elements of these uh, sites uh, in the historic environment record are the the core enclosures here, here, down here, but actually what we're seeing are larger uh, enclosed circuits surrounding them. This one at Largin uh, cuts across the, the spur. Known example here at Hall Rings where it does the same thing, a ditch cutting off the spur, um, but at St. Non's Camp, which is, this is the known element, actually we have got the same thing, a spur enclosure coming across. So, the Roman army potentially were moving into a region with uh, much larger defended spaces than we currently realize. And um, what we will try and do now is actually review the, the uh, excavated evidence for the chronology, the date range of some of these places to see actually whether we can attest that they were abandoned long before the arrival of the army or whether there is something in this that in fact we're seeing either a response to the arrival of, of the Roman army in Britain, the refortification and the enlargement of these defences, or are, um, are, is the Roman civil administration building routes to link these places? These places remain populated and in some have a, a function within Roman Britain. Some big questions there that may be now coming uh, out of the LIDAR data. Theme four um, is a little humorous one. It starts off with a humorous one. Um, volunteers kept spotting um, little square enclosures and um, in Cornish archaeology there's a there's a humorous uh, name for square enclosures you, you get rounds for circular and ovoid enclosed settlement spaces and there's a category of site um, called square rounds so they're more square than round but what we're noticing is that there's a trend for a very a very square a perfectly square category of site and they generally range between 40 and 60 meters um, in each axis and they're starting to occur in patterns. And to be honest, what they are, we're not sure, but they have the hallmarks morphologically of something constructed by the Roman army. Um, and this is something that we will now try and review one or two of these in the field with some geophysical survey, maybe some trial excavation to ascertain um, of what state they are and are they all of similar form. But it is interesting to note, and I've just got four slides, four images here, which kind of make, make a, a point, which is we've got a Prehistoric and Iron Age enclosed hill fort, Walkstow Berry in Cornwall, square enclosure just outside it with, with a viewpoint that would cover both entrances in this fort. 
in North Devon at Plaistow Barton, so this is just uh, northeast of Barnstable, uh, a single circuit of Iron Age Hillfort, entrance to the south, square enclosure looking straight at that entrance. Are these linked with either siege of these places during the Roman conquest, or are they associated with a Roman civil presence, an official presence that is working with and integrating these communities? And these are some very vague and broad questions that we're going to try and get um, into a little further over the next year or so of our project. The other thing I'm noticing is they're occurring in clusters. Um, here, um, this is actually far west, uh, south, south of the Halford Passage. Um, so the Halford Passage just here, um, off view, one square here, exactly the same phenomenon here. So there's a pair, okay, two, 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 two dots, Join them doesn't make a line, but it's curious that two identical features occur, occur along this ridge line. Morwenstow in North Cornwall, uh, we have a similar phenomenon where we have one, two, um, three, and then there's actually a fourth here. Um, so they're appearing in groups. And as I say, what are these? Are they frontier posts? Um, something that's never really been suggested, and, and to be honest, I wouldn't want to stake a claim to until we had some archaeological evidence. But they're definitely occurring in groups and lines, and they seem to be occurring in locations where we know that there's a, a later Iron Age uh, enclosed space which you might characterize as defensive. So we now have to ask the question are these uh, Roman military, and if so, what purpose do they serve? Uh, my final theme before we move over to questions is one of uh, longevity and how LIDAR uh, data can tell us about the, uh, the length of. Uh, the, the time depth within today's landscape, the historic landscape. Um, LIDAR data across the whole region is showing amazing relics of medieval field systems that have either been uh, agglomerated into larger fields or wiped away by parliamentary enclosure. Um, I spent three years uh, back in the early 2000s working on a project um, which was published with some colleagues where we actually tried to review the evidence for the um, legacy of the Roman field systems and Roman landscape within today's countryside and how much of it had an, an antecedent that led back to the Roman period. And the southwest was one of the regions where actually we didn't see archaeological evidence for much legacy. Now, we didn't have at that time the benefit of LIDAR data. So I just wanted to give one example here, um, which is somewhere we're hoping to um, have some funded excavation uh, and sampling next year. Um, so this is on the West southwest side of Dartmoor, just north uh, of Mary Tavy in the Tavistock area. Um, the image shows a, a, a slightly transparent version of the LIDAR data with the late 19th century ordnance survey map being the black lines and the labels, so the two are blended together. Um, and hopefully what you can make out using uh, the LIDAR is essentially we've got, in this area down here, we've got ridges of the ridge and fro for medieval systems. Um, so we can see elements of the framework of the medieval uh, landscape that have been lost, agglomerated into slightly larger fields. But also what we're seeing is very irregular um, earthwork, enclosures and patterns of fields, which are no doubt of late prehistoric or Roman origin. Um, and the key thing is that they then inform and, re and are reflected by the enclosed landscapes that we still have in those areas today. So those early, uh, those late prehistorical Roman landscapes are surviving to inform the shape of the medieval countryside that actually does survive today. And we have a whole cluster of little, uh, far, far, presumably farming communities with their um, agglomerated field systems in this area, here, here, um, whatever, at Horned and here, that actually are embedded and are fossilized within today's landscape. And one of the big archaeological questions for Dartmoor is, well, where are the Iron Age and Roman population? Well, we've got evidence of the exploitation of minerals, for example, on Dartmoor during the Roman period, but today very little evidence for where people were living. Um, I think the thing that the LIDAR is showing us, two things, that A, parts of the historic landscape have very deep origins. In fact, it's telling us where um, probably some of these late prehistoric and Roman communities were actually uh, residing, i.e. they were just on the fringes of the moor, not on the high moor. Uh, the image just to the bottom right here shows you the sort of thing that we see on the high moor and the unenclosed moor, uh, enclosed settlements, uh, either a wall or an earthen bank with a 
with hot circles within. It's these exact things that we're seeing down in the enclosed landscape. Um, and it's basically the transition, there's no break. We're seeing probably some continuation of these sites from maybe late prehistory into the early medieval period and medieval period. And what I'm hoping is that we can actually demonstrate archaeologically a very uh, long chronology for the occupation of these sites. That's, that's kind of, um, in brief, um, some big themes that are coming out of um, our exploration of LIDAR data, uh, our volunteers mapping, and it's my job to bring together and ask some of the academic questions of the data. Um, so happy now to um, answer any questions that anybody may have. Wow, amazing. Thank you so much, Chris. That was um, very, very interesting. It's so, it's so cool to see how uh, different civilizations have have worked the earth that we now live on and um you know how, how those those imprints through time can can uncover stories about civilizations and connectivity and you know all all of this is just it's just fascinating for me and and i'm sure for for everyone um we have got some questions already come up i believe um okay so guys um very happy for you to, to say your questions as well, if you're uh, capable. Uh, so, Valerie, you've got a question. Do you want to say it or shall I read it out? Shall I read it? I'll read it. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Oh, no, you got it. Go for it. My, uh, my equipment. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Chris. That's a very, very interesting project. I wanted to ask you, um, did you find any limitations when, when you use the LiDAR data? Yeah, I mean, there's several limitations, um, one of which is, um, I don't know how much anybody knows about uh, obtaining the data. So up until very recently, um, there's been data released almost annually from the Environment Agency. But the thing with that data is that it's very patchy in its coverage because it's focused on specific river catchments or hydrological systems that they're they're interested in for flood modeling and so um so we have gaps in that data so we used um another data set which was derived from a project called telus which was linked to mineral mapping but it does have the benefit of a complete coverage from just west of exeter across the whole southwest peninsula so for our work we relied um very much on the on telus data but unlike the environment age data, it is slightly lower resolution um, and it wasn't flown at optimal times for seeing through to the tree canopy. So for reviewing heritage in woodland, for example, it's almost useless. Um, but it has the benefit of complete coverage, so it's that trade-off. So with our volunteers at present, um, and bearing in mind these are huge data sets, you know, there's sort of 40 gigabytes of data that we're, we're ten sending off to volunteers. Um, We've actually now started to get um, coming through the new Environment AG National LIDAR program, which is, will be uh, completely available by, I believe, the end of next year, which is a, is a seamless coverage for the entire of the UK. And the Southwest has about, or the area we're looking at, has about 50% coverage so far. So we are now following up with the use of this higher resolution complete coverage data. So you're always limited by the time with LIDAR, by the time of year the data is captured it's only ever going to be as good as how much of the ground the, the pulses can get to in return. So yeah, we, we, we are limited. I mean, for example, one site which I can't go into the details of um, specifically, um, we've found a very exciting Roman site somewhere in the southwest, not visible at all on, on Hellas data because it was in woodland. Um, and it's now, now we have the complete coverage uh, for the environment energy data. Um, it wasn't covered on any previous series. We've now been able to see through the tree canopy. It was taken at a time of year when there was no leaf cover. And we've seen the most extraordinary preservation of, a, of an archaeological site on the ground. And it's only been visible on one time series of the LIDAR data. Um, and there will be hopefully more to follow on that one. It's um, just how to do some wrangling with landowners. Um, the other problem with LIDAR data is actually how do you train people to interpret the LIDAR? Um, I was fortunate that I had time to run two um, in-person workshops in the Tamar Valley um, over the winter. So we, we didn't come into this blind, but actually trying to train new volunteers um, whilst you know, not in person, you can't actually you know, look at an image as easily, et cetera. That, that has had its challenges and the systematic mapping that the volunteers have been doing um, 
it, I have set the challenge for some to have overlap. So we allocate uh, two kilometer grid squares to a volunteer. Um, so we've got a thousand number grids. So I have duplicated. And it is interesting to see how some people see things differently to others. Um, we're now working with um, a Historic England funded team out of Devon County Council um, who are professionals in aerial mapping and they are working with some of our data to kind of assess the value and assess the quality, a little bit of quality control um, of community LIDAR. And it's interesting that Historic England have funded this because I suspect it may be that with budgets being cut, et cetera, et cetera, that they do steer more towards bigger crowdsourced community projects, despite there being problems with the, the, how different people see different things. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so Jenkin, uh, is it Jenkin Loveday or Loveday Jenkin has a question. Um, do you want to say Loveday a question? Jenkin it is, yeah. Um, yeah, it was really looking at your road map or your mapping of your bits of roads. Yeah. There seems to be some that are linking river systems. Yeah. Now, so I wondered how much that was linked to the fact that early input might have been by river, sea and river rather than along roads and whether yeah. they were going up rivers and then building bits of roads across to the next river system. Yeah, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna bring up my um, PowerPoint again because that's a it is a really valid point. Um, if I can find that image. Yeah, if you look at the top of the Tamar and going through to what's that, the Camel or something. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. The, the, the key thing about um, pretty much every one of those military installations is they sit on either above either an a historic river crossing maybe in some instances the highest navigable historic historically navigable points that's certainly the case with the Foy and the Tamar um, or actually the lowest fording points so it is absolutely no doubt at all that the military installations that we're seeing are using those river systems and they're controlling them and I agree that actually, I think the my, my instinct is that the roads are secondary to this and they are then linking these important riverine sort of passages. Um, and certainly in the case of those that are navigable. Very interesting, and we haven't found traces of it yet, but the lower, the, the two westernmost um, dots on the map, Restormal and Nanstalen, the two uh, military bases there, there's evidence uh, from surface finds and metal detecting finds from Restormal, for example, that actually there was occupation of some form through into the fourth century. Now, we don't know that that has anything to do with military sites, but certainly there, there are people in that location throughout. And I think there's also a strong possibility that actually there's an overland bridge, um, you know, a, a portage point between those two rivers that are reflected by those two military installations. And, it would logically avoid um, the navigation of that quite treacherous southwest peninsula. Um, so I do think that um, there, there was probably to be found, and it may not be on LIDAR because LIDAR won't see everything that's been destroyed. There was probably a, a road or a, a well-made route between those two uh, river systems. It might well have been taken over by later medieval routes or... Exactly, and, and of course, the map that I show you here, the red lines only reflect at the moment this is all kind of ongoing it only reflects those elements that we're seeing as earthworks in fields or in land there are there are actually some segments within here that are fought, that you would project as being fossilized by current um roads so yeah the, the, the we would fill in some of those gaps if i was to actually add on to that map those road segments that are still in use today mm -hmm. um, and certainly in, in the west somerset uh, example for it here um, sorry, I'm going to my cursor. But if you look at the, in, in West Somerset, so it heads up towards Porlock, the short north south element has actually been traced pretty much all the way to Exeter. So, again, I believe, and this won't be a military play, but I think there's a, a strong likelihood there's an early civilian element, which is a, a north south road corridor going from the ex estuary up to the Bristol Channel. Um, and actually, that's a much more logical transport route and the movement of goods and people and maybe uh, the army going into South Wales and into Gloucestershire and having to backtrack and go all the way around and circumnavigate the Somerset levels, etc. So I, I think the connection between rivers, roads and the coast is, is a really key thing in the South West. 
Mm. Glad you agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, Robin, you had a question as well. You're muted. <laughs> Um, I've got quite a few. <laughs> Which one would do you want me to start with? The one about hallmarks. Ah, yes, yes. Chris, I think at one point, I scribbled it down and I can't read my handwriting, but I think you said at one point uh, there were the hallmarks of, um, uh, of a site having been disrupted by the Roman army. And I was just in, it's a detail, I guess, but I was just intrigued as to what would those hallmarks be and how can you identify them as against all the other possible meanings that something might have? Yeah, it, it, I, I'm trying to think what I may have said. So it, this is the sense of the army coming along and having an impact on... Yes, it, um, it, it seemed to imply a pre-existing site yeah. for the arrival of the Romans. Yeah, yeah. Would therefore, suggest why they'd gone there. And yeah, what okay. Um, what yeah, sure. Of disruption, even. Yeah, I mean, it. The idea of conflict um, and a, and essentially a bloodbath, obviously, fell out of fashion in the past twenty or thirty years. Of kind of you know, more civilized attitudes, but I'm afraid I I don't now wholly believe that we can rule out the fact that the Roman army on the march encountered people that they essentially fought with and slaughtered. We've got evidence from um, Ham Hill in Somerset, for example, of slaughter on a massive scale um, associated with military fittings, ballista bolts, etc. You know, huge numbers of corpses. We get military installations um, inside hill forts as if the hill forts have been taken over. Um, and I can't help but think that actually we shouldn't we shouldn't always think it's going to be necessarily conflict and there's, there's diplomacy involved, but I'm afraid I also think that there is strong evidence for tactical positioning of our camps and some of our smaller forts in locations where they're essentially then able to push the frontier. So they're essentially having forward advance bases where we then see smaller camps that are actually located nearer to these Iron Age hill forts than these defended places. And the, 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 if they're not stationing themselves for diplomatic reasons, then the only other conclusion you can draw is actually they are siege works and they are stationing themselves for conflict. Um, the archaeological evidence in the Southwest is very limited, read none, um, because we haven't seen any extensive excavations within our hill forts. Um, but there are a number of signs, one of which being these larger extended defensive circuits which are only now really being seen through uh, the lidar data um you know okay they may be well before uh, the roman conquest but what, what we aim to do now is to review um all hill fort locations to see for which ones show signs of embellishment or change and are they actually the ones that are in proximity to where we know the army and in fact the civil administration are are creating new infrastructure to see if there's a, um, a trend there. Um, there is the, the examples that I've showed here, for example, the two there, Pencaro Rounds and Largin Castle, are one of a number in that little, the, the stars on that map are hill forts. This is an Oxford project mapping hill forts, and I should say that they range from small enclosures. Um, to big hill forts. So there, there's a whole range of archaeological sort of sites in, in, in that data set. But the ones that are in that little cluster of stars, um, sort of uh, where Pencaro rounds is, there is a no noticeable trend for all bar, I think it's all bar two in that region to have this extra defensive circuit, these broader um, sets of enclosure. And it just happens to be where we've got military installations. Um, roads. Um, as I said, there, there, there is some other evidence coming online for um, a very substantial military presence um, in, in that area as well, which hopefully I'll release sometime in the, early in the new year. Um, but yeah, I, I actually think we, we, we have to reflect on the fact that this new evidence, the, the, the sheer number of military sites we see in the southwest compared to if you move east into Dorset and there beyond and look at the distribution map of ports, 
account, etc. It implies that there was a need for a, a, a dispersed, but actually quite a large military presence. And I don't think that is for diplomatic reasons. It can only be because they, there needed to be a level of um, control. And the military period, as we understand it, is only about 30 years. The Legion supposedly moved to Gloucester in the late 70s, early 80s, after arriving in, 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 in the very late 40s and 50s. So is this reflective of a short, sharp shock, um, still lasting 20, 30 years? But what we've not got here is this military presence that you see in Northern England, which goes on for several hundred years. Um, but it does strike me that um, we have an uncharacteristic uncharacter number of military sites compared to lowland England. Um, you know, it's more akin to Wales than the Scottish lowlands. Um, why is that? Um, and I think it's possibly because there was resistance. And there's an academic debate about whether the Southwest became essentially an imperial estate. So it was an imperial monopoly, and this is perhaps why we don't get the proliferation of villas, private wealth isn't developing, and people aren't being able to demonstrate their, um, their gains of being part of the Roman Empire, simply because it was the empire that gained from the Southwest. And in that, in that respect, maybe it is the sort of region where you'd expect to see a, a, a large but relatively short-lived military occupation because you're establishing it as, a, as an imperial estate, as, as imperial property. And could that be related to the minerals that we know were known um, in, from coming out of the southwest in both the Bronze Age and the Iron Age? Um, still no really firm archaeological evidence for that. But there are some themes here which kind of suggest that there was a need for, for a relatively strong but short-lived military intervention in the southwest. Sorry, um, a bit of a that was great. I, I'm sure there's uh, many Demonians that would like to think we uh, we put up a good fight. So yeah, um, so um, the next question was from Michael Flumain. Michael, are you there? Yes, uh, Flumain, yes. Sorry. <laughs> I, I was, no worries, no worries, no worries. I had a couple questions. Uh, one was uh, just, using, uh, just using AI software instead of, uh, instead of people for uh, looking for the actual, you know, mm -hmm. for regular, I suppose, the, you know, the natural irregular shapes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Again, as I, as I said earlier, I, I'm not the tech, technical brains behind the data. My colleague, Joao Fonte, is, um, he, he is actually running, uh, co-running a project in Exeter at the moment where we're teaming up with computer science department to look at artificial intelligence and can we train, um, train a computer essentially to identify archaeological sites on LIDAR, much like it's used for crater detection on the moon. As we had, we had in, uh, a really good presentation actually uh, only last week um, from someone in Campbell School of Mines who was looking at late post medieval mineral crystals in Dartmoor and could she train a computer to recognize these based on LIDAR derived uh, models? And it worked very well. So, yes, um, it's actually very possible. My, uh, there's a bit of a, a to and fro between Joao and myself about this is that all computers put people like me and my volunteers out of work, but I actually. I think the, <laughs> the subtleties and the nuances within archaeological anomalies are such that it's going to be very hard to train a computer without hundreds and thousands of images with it, from which they can learn. But obviously, actually, those hundreds of thousands of images might not necessarily show the same thing. We're not just looking at a pit in the ground or, a, or you know, a moon crater, if you're going to think about it in terms of big data images. There's subtlety and nuances to every single archaeological site or every category of archaeological sites that are, I think very much will complicate things for um, computer aided recognition. Um, people are now trying it, including you know, Joao, my colleague, um, but I'm yet to see any convincing results that are, that are going to be consistent and reliable. I think there'll always still be a need for manual verification. Um, oh, right, right. No, I wasn't. Uh, yeah, no, I, I want you to keep your job. I was <laughs> thinking more about um, they, so, some of the lines that they seem, they're so subtle. I was thinking that the, the AI would identify an area where the humans could go look, whereas opposed yeah. to the areas, areas yeah. where a human might miss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually identifying, if we, do, we would term it as, as micro topography, areas that have a uh, uh, yeah, diverse micro topography versus areas that are essentially flat and plain, I think is actually a very 
a more sensible way, in my view, of actually approaching AI than thinking that you can set a, set a computer up to run for three months and it will find every trace of Iron Age hill forts in the country. Right. Or um, That's what they're actually modeling. They're seeing, can, can they train a computer to recognize hill forts in the Southwest? And I don't think um, they're going to find it as easy as, as, as they hope. But I think a better way, is, as you've described, is actually identify high potential areas for which right. the, we then, then archaeologists can focus on. And frankly, in a region like the southwest of England, it, it probably would almost be pointless doing that because a human eye can actually scan over this data re relatively rapidly. If you think of, say, the Amazon, for example, where we've also got colleagues in Exeter, I don't know if anybody's seen it in the news recently, in fact, in the past few days, um, they're actually identifying uh, new, new uh, settlement sites in, across the Amazon using LIDAR. And a colleague of mine, uh, mine Jose Iriati, um, had a big European grant uh, where they had bespoke LIDAR flown for large parts of the Amazon. Um, and actually, that's a very much a big geographical area where exactly that approach would be really important and actually valuable because it is simply of a scale that is beyond rapid human assessment. Right. So I think in terms of say our, the southwest region, you could I, I could probably rapidly scan this this that the image that we can see in front of us in a in a day or two and assess the potential. But you think how many months or years that would take for the Amazon or big landscapes, desert land what are now desert landscapes, for example. I think that, that is where the exactly the thing you're describing would be hugely valuable. Got it. I had a follow-up question, if I could. Um, Go for it. Um, so this this concept of using the rivers for navigating instead of the roads for, I, I thought, I, I understood you saying that the, they would use the rivers to go back and forth between the forts. And of course, going down rivers is easy, coming up rivers has a tendency not to be. But I don't, I don't know the topography of that area such that, uh, um, you know, what kind of boats did they use, or do we know? Yeah, um, we actually have very little evidence, and, I, and I'm not suggesting that any of the inland waterways are actually navig na navigable, um, but it's certainly we're seeing a trend for um, a number of permanent garrisons on the navigable heads of, of estuarine rivers. So, uh -huh. um, for example, on the south coast that we can see here, there's, there's, there's the site of Restormal, um, so that's the southwestmost dot on that map. And in the center, there's Calstock, and there that's at the naval head of the Tamar. Exeter, um, which um, has a whole string of military establishments from the fortress all the way down the ex estuary as far as, as, far as the, the historic port town of Topton. We now know there are five different locations that have military, um, the military bases, supply depots along that estuary. And, it seems to me that the army are definitely using uh, the coast and the estuaries to maybe move into regions, but also definitely to supply them when the garrisons are, are well established. Um, for example, I would expect to see uh, something similar on the River Parrot. Um, I, I was trying to find my cursor. So all, all I, I suggest that we would expect to see Roman military presence on many of the major estuaries within within this region. So in North Devon, the Barnes area, oh, yeah, yeah. Mm, brilliant Bridgewater area, uh, for example. Thank you. Um, Peter, you had a question. Peter Freeman. Hi. Uh, yeah, you're obviously uh, turning up all sorts of um, sites that are new, mm. either completely new or uh, extensions of bits around sites you already know about, uh, far more than you could ever hope to get around to excavating. Yeah. Um, is the next stage for most of these uh, a, a geophys visit to get at? Uh... Um, I think, well, w once we are able to resume our field work, um, yes, we will be undertaking some geophysics, but even then, I mean, we will have tallied up hundreds of sites just of, in the time scales that we're focusing yeah. on here we my aim is to identify a number of um example sites so tip that, that represent a good example of numerous sites so test one example of a yeah. of a form of site so those little square enclosures we're seeing i'd love to go and survey one or two of those see if there's consistency between them 
some of these yeah. big sites, these hill forts, for example, there's the time involved to survey these complexes are just far at the moment far outside of what the resources we have available. Um, we also have a uh, an obligation to our funders, the lottery, to kind of stick to something uh, approximating to the project that we originally got funding for, and that was to look at two fairly small areas, this little kernel in the Tamar Valley, which is a cluster of three or four parishes surrounding the falls of Cowstock. Um, but obviously with a big data project like this, we've reacted to COVID and we've actually gone big scale, but we, in terms of field work, we will need to contract that down. So if possible, I will look to survey some of these sites and indeed do some trial excavations within that kernel area that, that our project is actually focused in. So there are, for example, several of these smaller enclosures in that area. Um, there's a good length of the Roman Roman road that we can go and test. Um, and generally you find that the, the landowners are, are a lot of goodwill. Yeah, so as much as I'd like to say that we're gonna go out surveying for the next two years, it's very unlikely that we'll probably survey more than maybe 10 of them, I should think, in total, but it'll have to be well-chosen sites that enable us to say something about the much bigger number. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, another name that I'm going to completely mispronounce, uh, Jaizem Daughter. That's so wrong. Um, if no, it's fine. Thank I mean, it's Gizam. Thank you. <laughs> Gizam. Oh, excellent. Um, yes, you have a question as well. Yeah, uh, I was wondering um, which softwares you used for um, first the um, processing and then in the post-processing, did you use uh, the relief visualization toolbox, which I find really useful in archaeological applications yeah. of LIDAR. And also you mentioned that uh, you were working with English Heritage. So is there a pipeline for community LIDAR analysis work? Which <laughs> Yeah, uh, so I shall restate again. I'm very much not the technical side of processing the data. Um, Joao, who processes the data, does use um, the visualization toolbox for small areas, but because we're using such large scale data, he actually uses a set of plugin tools within um, ArcGIS. And I think he also uses another, another um, piece of software as well. And if, if you wanted to, my email is on the front of front side. If you wanted to get in touch, I could certainly put you in contact with Joao. We could share the details of how we are processing data at different scales. Um, um, if you'd it's, like. It's, it, yes, uh, I will note the email address. It was it in the first slide. Yeah, I so my the, email address is on the opening slide. Um, so it, it's, you can write it down. It's just c.j.smart at Exeter dot ac dot uk and feel free to email me and i can put you in touch with joao who's i know more than happy to kind of help and, and offer his his experience of data manipulation um the second part of your question was about oh yeah oh. historic england um yeah so i think the realization is that to to use all forms of aerial imagery and remote sensing data not geophysical survey but lidar Etc. satellite imagery it means that the traditional um, theme of the national mapping program that historic England and their predecessor name of English heritage funded are no longer possible on the scale that they used to be so whereas uh, national mapping program projects were often county based they're now very likely to be smaller parts of county because the amount of data that now needs to be reviewed to achieve the same aim is much greater so I think there is a general steer um, towards um, realising that actually if we're to achieve big coverage, then actually there needs to be uh, public participation. And um, to date, Historic England um, have supported those initiatives, but have never really, I don't think, directly funded them themselves. So we're often not, we see um, the National Lottery Heritage Fund funding uh, often protected landscapes to integrate community participation within LIDAR data analysis. So for example, a project just about to start in Snowdonia National Park, um, where they have bespoke LIDAR flown and they're gonna do uh, several years worth of exactly what we're doing, which is community LIDAR mapping. Um, the Kilton, Kilton's A and B, for example, have done one. Um, we're in discussions, Joao and I are in discussions with Dartmoor National Park um, and 
will be um, putting a proposal forward to the lottery to do exactly that for Dartmoor National Park, which is the UK's kind of premier archaeological landscape, if you will. It's got the highest concentration of known archaeological sites of anywhere in the country and hasn't had a traditional NMP in a, at a time where you've got not only LIDAR data, but also satellite imagery. So I think as time rolls on, we are going to see more and more of these large scale uh, big data but public participation projects and they may actually be steered not within sort of historic England our, our national heritage organization but from within uh, other statutory bodies councils AOMVs national parks uh, for example and um, maybe other universities like us I think at the moment we're kind of perhaps the only university to do this in the UK but as alluded to we've got colleagues that are doing Big scale LIDAR work elsewhere, but not really involved in public participants, um, which I think is a missed opportunity. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I will email him. Thank you. Uh, yes. Brilliant. Um, we are actually going to come on to uh, people who have already asked questions. So I'm actually going to take this opportunity to get my questions, the many questions that are in my head out of the way, <laughs> but I'm going to keep it short. So as a, as a North Devon boy, got a couple of North Devon questions. The first one is you mentioned Robra coins. Mm -hmm. Were those coins produced in Robra or just no, no, no. The, the These are coming in to so this, this little collection of coins here. So there's um, nine coins. No, they, um, they're, they're coming in from the continent, but they're of a, of a type that it basically, we, we know when they're minted, um, we know a lot about the, not only the emperors, obviously, but the, the mints of different coins. And, and these have a, a minting window of about five years, but it's five years preceding the Roman invasion of Britain. So right. these are undoubtedly coming in with some of the earliest military um, personnel. And the question is, well, you've got the, the uh, con conquest in the southeast, 250 miles away. How come these unworn, very early coins are in southwest Britain, um, adjacent to a navigable estuary? Um, when we're starting to see quite a lot of evidence for temporary marching camps that you put down to being part of the initial military incursions. Have we got some sea, uh, sea born uh, scouting parties that are essentially jumping on and off land all the way across the south coast prior to the, the land-based march uh, westwards? Okay. So that's what I think these coins could represent are some very early maritime scouting parties. Um, my other question was that Holsworthy appears to be an immense cold spot, <laughs> um, and which is actually kind of a bit of a modern day North Devon joke in itself. Um, it's quite it's, it's quite exposed and blowy out that way. I've got to admit, there's not a lot when you drive through that area. There's not a lot there. Nope. <laughs> Perhaps it was just a giant forest or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So actually, this map is the one. So yeah. So I apologise that the distribution maps are cut in half and this is part of the problem we have when dealing with a study area that essentially straddles two counties is that you end up with things that are done on a county level but you're right to say that kind of area sort of north of Launceston sort of north of Oakhampton sort of mid Devon north north east Cornwall are very blank there's not a lot known archaeologically now the question is are those real blanks and the what we're picking up now in the LIDAR data is that some of our um, the the, the largest concentrations of new sites that we're seeing when i talk about sites i'm not talking about medieval aspects but iron age maybe roman sites are in that area so i think we will be fleshing out the picture of that landscape mm. um, i think one of the, the reasons things survive so well in that area to be seen as lidar anomalies is because actually that there aren't large areas of medieval plowland i think quite a lot of that landscape was um, unimproved pasture, maybe even open grazing for such a long period of time that actually the subtle archaeological earthworks survive quite well. Um, and actually it's in those areas where we have a lot of medieval cultivation that actually we've lost, lost a lot of the traces. So we're seeing better preservation in areas that weren't as intensively used from the medieval period onwards. And that is exactly the region you're talking about. Mm. All right. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, so Michael, I believe you had asked about the types of boats that the Romans were using. Ah, yes, sorry, I didn't, I didn't answer that. No, that's um, right. Uh, yeah, not, not um, a great deal is known. Um, we have, have sort of 
written descriptions. Um, we've got some excavated examples from elsewhere in the UK. Not so long back, I was actually looking into this uh, to, to look at a data set, which was essentially what are the known Roman period or Roman uh, boats and you know, et cetera known. And most of the ones that are actually known in the UK are simply log boats, um, which are essentially not going to be linked with military. These are just going to be people, so, you know, the, the resident native population moving around rivers, etc. So in terms of how we, the, the ship, the vessels that we think of the Roman army moving along the coast versus kind of from a long distance, uh, very little is actually known, um, unfortunately. Um, I'd, I'd like to kind of do more work um, in some of the estuarine environments. Um, very early on after the discovery of the port at Calstock, we worked um, with a chap who's based in Plymouth called Peter Holt, and he did some um, marine geophysical surveying and bathymetry up the Tamar with a view to seeing well, what relics can we see um, within the estuary that may relate to this period. And she wasn't very successful because of the amount of background noise. But I suspect, you know, we've, there's a lead anchor stock which may be Roman in the Tamar. Um, there's a lovely great chunk of amphora. So I suspect that somewhere in the um, in, in the certainly in, the, in my local history, the Tamar, there are there are probably preserved Roman period um, craft watercraft. And it's just a case yeah, of yeah. Well, it, and what comes to mind is the, the way the Vikings um, designed their ships. They had the uh, uh, shallow, if I'm mm -hmm. saying it correctly, the shallow draft with the yeah. with the round yeah. bottom. So they, and I'm just wondering if the you know it'd be it'd be interesting to see the, the comparison between the two. And if, in fact, uh, the Romans came up with a different design or used a similar design. Yeah, it's, it's a, a, re a really interesting and obviously I, I am at present, well not at present, but have been thinking more and more on this is because we're working on the ground in a number of, on a number of sites now, but essentially you'd think sit at the navigable heads of these rivers and that's the, sort of the Tor Torridge, the um, Tamar. And we know from historical accounts of where uh, Kind of ocean going, sea, sea, seafaring boats were able to get to. But then there's the issue, well, are you seeing smaller, shallow draft vessels going further upstream and then, you know, transshipment between vessels that are then sort of, you know, for, for seafaring? Um, and actually just how far up some of these estuaries you would have been able to get prior to the, the known and well-attested medieval silting of some of these estuaries. Um, a particular phenomenon in the southwest um, and, and certainly coming off of Dartmoor is that we've got good medieval documentation for the silting up of harbours and some of the, uh, the navigable rivers due to the amount of in-streaming and the sediments coming off the moor. So actually the navigable heads as are reflected in sort of the 17th, 18th, 19th century of some of these rivers may actually be much lower down those watercourses than actually um, 1500 years previous. Um, so it would be nice to now think of, of, of asking some targeted questions of um, sort of physical geographers of, of well, what are some of the true navigable heads at different points in time of some of these estuaries to see well, actually how far up may waterborne craft actually, actually actually have got. And so there's some, some you know good questions and, and hopefully people will start to pick up on this as as, as legitimate questions and not just take the historical accounts and historical narratives as being something that therefore is broadly similar 15 years um, early, 1500 years earlier. Mm. On a slightly different subject, um, I, I put a link in the chat. I don't know if you've heard of Earthwatch, yes. but okay. That would be a great, you have heard of them or yes, you see the link. <laughs> no, 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 I, I have heard of Earthwatch. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, we, I, I took my, it was my, my way of connecting with my teenagers, but that's a whole nother story to talk about that over a pint. But, but uh, so we ended up in the, in, in the Northeast there and they, you know, they, they helped uh, excavate part of Hadrian's wall and it was just a great experience, but, but they, uh, they, they, um, they're now switching to virtual as, as, as everyone. So they might be a good organization to, uh, to connect with because part of, it, not only do you have volunteers, but the volunteers pay, you know, it's a sort of scientist thing. So you pay a certain amount of money to help fund the research and yeah. then participate in the research. So yeah. if you want me to connect you with somebody there, I'm happy to. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, um, yeah, I've got your details in the, in the chat, presumably. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great. I mean, 
you see, traditionally, I mean, my, my knowledge of Earthwatch is that it's, it's largely people are paying to attend excavations. Um, we had one in the southwest, in fact. Um, but actually, the idea of it now becoming more involved in remote working and, and, and you know, de data heavy kind of work is a, is a, is a really interesting idea. Um, there's a, another organization called UK based called Dig Ventures, um, which I know are moving into some, some more remote working um, versus things that are in the field. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that they go. Um, at the moment, we're just we're trying to look to achieve funding for um, a lot a lot lottery grant for three or four years for Dartmoor. And the one the one thing about the lottery is that they always want you to support your applications with as much um, funding in kind. Uh, it, it's match funding. So the more sources that we can think to actually find that, the better. And something as an iconic landscape as I like to think it is Dartmoor actually might be a really, a really sort of a positive one to approach with a, an organisation like Earthwatch because it is it's so well known and, and, you know, I'm considered to be well known, you know, in large parts of the uh, of the, um, the Western world as well. So yeah, maybe, maybe that's, a, a, I've, I've written it down, I'm going to follow that up. Thank you. Not at all. And I'll give you my email in the chat. Yeah. Excellent. Um, Robin had a uh, all encompassing map question, I believe. I did, yes. Well, you, we've already touched on some of it. I was. It follows on from Gizem's question about um, mapping software. I was wondering to what extent all those people are using mappings of one kind or another, whether it's physical geography, agricultural, historical patterns, and, and so on. To what extent there's a kind of standardization or an ability to talk to each other and then overlay different maps from different eras or from different disciplines even to enrich the picture you, you were mentioning say the the Holsworthy area being an area where there was a relatively intact um, field, field patterns but that's done presumably from local knowledge mm -hmm. rather than from any data and likewise when we're looking at water courses and things like wells we we had a really interesting talk on ancient trees a few months or so ago. And I'm wondering to what extent we can actually merge and get these all these different data sets to talk to each other mm. and to reveal further aspects of the landscape. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my background is very much as a as a landscape archaeologist of the historic period. So I wouldn't I wouldn't just say that I have a specialism in Rome, late, late Iron Age and Roman transition. Actually, I've spent an awful lot of time mapping the medieval landscape and looking at ways in which we can reconstruct it and deconstruct it using exactly those sources that you're, you're looking at. So we, we take into account things such as agricultural land classification, so the, the, uh, the technical soil qualities, for example, in, in trying to understand uh, settlement patterns, where, where, where may we predict that actually there are genuine blanks because soil quality um, hydrology is of such poor quality it's not actually going to sustain the farming community, even as self, you know, a, a relatively small scale one, two thousand years ago. So we we do try and integrate as much of the of the of the background physical data, um, historic map data as possible. And the, the one thing that myself and others in the southwest have done has, has been done in large parts of the UK now is is characterise the historic landscape. So we we look at well. What is the origin of different field patterns, um, field systems, as we can see them on the earliest maps? So generally, the late nineteenth century will be serving that. But what are the origins of different parts of this landscape? And I have to say that large parts of the area that we were just talking about around the Holsworthy area, and in fact around North Torton, where there was a very nice straight piece of road, actually those areas are characterised by relatively late uh, field systems of relatively late origin. They're not in our 11th, 12th century medieval heartland. Um, I suspect by using that, that sort of more historical approach to analysing landscape, we can actually um, highlight areas that were probably genuinely unenclosed or at least very lowly, um, low intensification of use uh, back into pre-medieval time. Um, the fact that we have earthworks in some areas that survive so well to me is a very good indicator that they were largely unused um, probably what about, between what about 
What about something like the Doomsday Book, which is mm. a written record rather than an actual map and doesn't lend itself to the kind of precision that we'd normally look for? Yeah. But it's an incredibly rich source of information about what was going on, what what land was occupied and what it meant in terms of the the more powerful people being in certain places, the, the ability to tap into the, um, the the resources of the soil and even the number of people living in that area. Yeah. Is, is that something that can be mapped in, and then well, that, There's, there's a, a, a very um, nice series of regional, um, they're called the Doomsday Geographies. Um, I think there's about seven of them in all, I think written in the 60s or 70s uh, from memory. And in those, there's been attempts to, to convert the, uh, the data into graphical representations. So looking at the whole manner of things from woodland to arable, uh, number of pigs, salt works, etc. So there has been an attempt to, to represent uh, that data graphically. Um, and actually, it, it, I think it works quite well. And you can actually see that um, it, in, in fact, where I strip some of the, the two maps that we're currently looking at um, out of a, another presentation, um, I actually compared those to the doomsday geography of population. And mm -hmm. actually, it's surprising um, that actually the two marry rather well, apart from the moors, um, where we see a higher density of sites, but bearing in mind that a lot of those moorland sites are likely to be uh, pre-late Miocene, so some of those might be bronze. Um, we do have some deserted medieval settlements on the fringes of the war, but they seem to have come into existence and lost uh, after the 11th century, so not really counted for in our doomsday uh, figures. But actually, there is, there is a genuine cor correlation between these sort of distribution maps of late prehistoric and potentially Roman population densities, if you'll use the proxy of, population, uh, of site presence through population density, it does actually correlate rather well with the doomsday presence, apart from some of our emerging urban centres. So no, I, I, I think that is a very valid approach for looking at trends over time. And bearing in mind, we don't really have any data for the intervening period. So you know, the, there's, a, there's a few things, 400 through to 1,000 or you know, the latter part of the 11th century, we don't really have any empirical evidence or in fact much archaeological evidence for where people were. So we, we have to look at that earliest source to see well, where our population is at that time. And that's the only source for that is the doomsday. But yeah, so, so it is a worthwhile data set to explore. And unfortunately, someone has done a lot of the work. I'm sure there's probably new approaches to mapping that data. Um, not that I've seen anybody attempt, but there's probably a uh, new theoretical uh, models with which can be applied to the same data it may show different things but um, yeah those things do exist mm, excellent um so we have uh love day could the larger enclosures that you've uh highlighted in in some of your the lidar maps you've brought up could any of them have been trading posts yeah my point was was that could there have been trading posts before the invasion and that mm -hmm. might be why why you've got collections of coins potentially in places because there was a pre-invasion phase where people were traveling up the rivers and trading yeah i mean it is it is a bit of a chicken and egg situation um with some of these sites and i i'm yet to have any firm conclusion other than the fact that there is a definite trend now for the fact that some of our military sites sit very close to what look like late Iron Age power centers, kind of some, you know, where the elite sites, um, or at our Roman military sites themselves, there are these additional enclosures. Now, it's again, for, for example, if we look at the bottom left image here, Calstock, I still have no firm answer as to what the larger enclosures surrounding the fort is despite having excavated two trenches across it and actually you know done a lot of uh, geophysical survey it effectively blocks one of the principal entrances in and out of the fort so lo logically it, it doesn't sit as being contemporary um, 
it's of the size and scale of something that could be Iron Age, a, a hilltop enclosure slash hill fort. Um, but you have this problem that it's the when the ditches are filled in, they're being filled in with Roman Roman military period ceramic. Is that because it's an open ditch when the army arrive and they simply backfill it during their occupation? Um, and I think elsewhere we're seeing certainly in the site that you can see to the north of Ashbury, um, there are indications that that whole military complex sits within something more sub-oval, um, not quite as regular and square, the same we're seeing at Lapco. But it is this question of which comes first and which comes after. Um, and then it comes down to this issue of, well, how much conflict are we seeing based on proximity of our military installations versus what may be very late Iron Age, um, early pre-Roman times? Or are simply our official establishments being set up to enable the integration of these existing communities and the polity within, um, within this part of the empire? So I'm afraid I have no firm answers, but there will be answers to be found. And next year, in fact, um, when we're able to meet with our volunteers and, and dig again, we've got eight weeks of excavation planned um, at council. And one of the big questions is to really understand the relative chronology of this large hilltop enclosure with our fort and our marching camp, and actually use this as one of these type sites with which we can understand and propose what the sequences may be elsewhere. Yeah, that's <laughs> really interesting to uh, look at that because- Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the. Uh, on the opposite end of the scale, it's possible that some of these military sites, such as Lapwood, for example, maybe Cudmore, are they retained post the military phase and essentially become um, um, mansio? So these are official posts on the Roman sort of infrastructure, so on the Roman road routes, etc. Are these later, are these second, third, fourth century retained locations that? serve an official trading function or administrative function. There's a site in Dorset near Bradford Abbas, for example, which was always thought to be a first century uh, playing card shaped fort sat um, adjacent to a known Roman road, but excavation by the National Trust uh, last year or the year before established that it's actually fourth century in date. So it's like a, it's a defended um, commercial centre astride a Roman road, which morphological grounds alone looks like a Roman fort. But actually when you excavate it, we found the evidence that it isn't first century at all, it's actually late Roman and reflects this period of instability in the mid fourth century. Um, are some of the sites here, if you, for, for example, hardly any of these sites have seen anything approaching large scale excavations. Lapford, for example, with two small trenches largely focused on the defensive surface of the fort itself, nothing on the outside. How stop largely been the fort's defences, nothing within the internal space of the larger enclosure. It's the same pattern we see all the time, very small scale evaluative excavations that simply look to confirm the date of the known military enclosure, not actually anything that's going on outside of it. So often case with many different disciplines with archaeology, it's focusing on what we want to confirm and not actually asking the question about what is outside, a bit like Roman villas, for example. Yeah, it's, it's like the perspective that, um, you know, the Romans are coming into something where nothing happened before, but yeah. actually there was something happening before the Romans came, mm. either to trade or military or advance or, or whatever, yeah. you know, the, the whole complex set up before that. So, yeah, there's, there's I mean, there, and I think the South, the Southwest is particularly important for that sort of issue because we know that there are written accounts and we know that there's material coming out of the Southwest Peninsula. It can be no coincidence, for example, that although we don't have any direct evidence for in the far southwest peninsula, that the, um, the Second Augustan Legion were at Charterhouse on Mendit within a matter of two, three years of the conquest, extracting lead and silver. Um, and to me, that just implies a pre existing knowledge of an industry that they've gone in, we've taken and taken. It exactly, over. because we know that minerals went from Cornwall to other places. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, prior, 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 yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah. The thing that we haven't seen here is actually, uh, despite proximity of some of these military sites to mineral bearing districts, I mean, the house what sits within the one of the richest mineral bearing districts probably in the world at one point. Certainly, it's got the largest copper deposit, largest ex exploitation of copper in the 19th century. What we don't really have is any direct evidence for 
extraction via official routes. And I wonder whether actually existing um, industries, um, native run industries aren't simply being kind of co-opted into the system. They're not actually being yeah. directly taken over. Hence um, my question about the trading posts, are they bringing the material to a point whereby, you know, then they're trading it at that point? Yeah. It'd be really interesting to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go to another meeting, Kevin. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I believe Robin, you had a westward thinking question. <laughs> I do, and it follows on exactly the same point. In fact, about what was happening in Cornwall long before the Romans. In fact, even probably before the Celts. And um, there is a fascinating story of which I only know snippets about Carn Bray and the, the hill above uh, Red Ruth, mm. which suggests that it was in the late Neolithic era, an industrial site trading with flint from uh, around St Michael's Mount area, working that flint, and that's then marketed or traded or whatever across large parts of the country, I believe as, as far north as Northumberland, although I'm yeah. not, not quite sure of that. So what I'm, that would seem to me to be a site crying out for the kind of discoveries that LIDAR can introduce us to. So I was wondering to what extent there is work being done this far west. And in, is there a community of scholars in the LIDAR world, for example, who you might know of or who we might even be, be able to interest them mm. in having a look at this area? Um, the answer to that in short is no. The, there are archaeologists obviously for whom it is interesting and people that dip in and out of LIDAR as they would any other form of data. And so that they might be interested in location and they'll try and obtain LIDAR data just to study its location. But some of the, the bigger, there's, there's no one else that's really, or no other projects in the Southwest that are really trying to use LIDAR to address bigger themes by looking at across a broad region. There's certainly people that, I mean, definitely now that we're seeing more and more uh, discoveries coming through, not only our work, but the, the, um, the national mapping program teams, it, it's clear that as we go forward in the next five years, there will be more and more systematic use of LIDAR for exploring not only kind of the historic periods of of, of history and um, archaeology, um, but actually prehistory as well. We, for, for example, um, and it, it still fascinates me how this is kind of deviating, but it's just how much there is of a very early date that is to be found. I'm actually just going to just stop uh, changing because it's really pertinent to what you've just said. I'm just going to put on my, right. Um, so this is um, my sort of master GIS. I'm just going to find my way into it. And it's precisely because you think the further you go back in time, the less likelihood is that you're going to have surviving earthworks of anything that's that deeply prehistoric, so Neolithic. We've got our burial monuments, our Bronze Age barrows, etc. But I was just panning around one day, just seeing what the potential was. And I suddenly noticed this 120 meter long lozenge on Cardinham Downs. And essentially, it looks like a Neolithic cursus, not recorded, not known, but exactly the right morphology. I thought, well, does it point to anything? I looked west, and I spotted this on another part of the down with a concentric signatures of a concentric spaced pits on the inside. The signature of the lidar is that you've got a ditch on the inside and a bank on the outside, which is exactly what you'd expect for a hinge. So we're talking a Neolithic, potentially, um, I've shown it to a few people who kind of agree, it looks like a completely unknown Neolithic ceremonial landscape on a well-trodden path, you know, next to the A30, um, that only, wow. LIDAR, only LIDAR is showing. And so I wow. think to answer your point, the potential, certainly in our unenclosed landscapes, of which this, you know, you can categorize this part of Cardinal Downs as, 
um, although it's seen agriculture improvement because you can see the regular crisscrossing of drainage networks, etc., from, um, from the post medieval centuries. But I think you're absolutely right that the potential here isn't just about our big earthwork enclosures, our Iron Age sites, um, Roman, then our medieval landscapes. There is potential for some really early and monumental discoveries. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've got no, in, there's very little interest in this, the prehistory of this, this far back, but I, I'm so curious about this location that I actually would like to take some volunteers and do a little bit of trial survey, but certainly of this big potential, um, the enclosure on the west. I mean, I think the cursus is, is almost as first, but this is so curious with it, with the, with the curved linear form and the, the suggestion of an arc of concentric pits on the inside. It, I mean, it has all the hallmarks of, 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 of part of a henge. And they say that for several hundred meters across. Fantastic. Well, um, we've actually stolen a whole extra minute of your time tonight. Um, so <laughs> That's right. I have You're just lucky that uh, the children haven't burst in. <laughs> That'd be a highlight moment for the, that'd be one for the end of year album, that. Um, <laughs> no, thank you so much, Chris, for this talk this evening. I mean, You're very welcome. You've opened, uh, you've opened the doors for many people and the, the, the wonder of archaeology and, and seeing the different, different patterns on our landscape is, um, is something that can keep you occupied for the rest of your life and you'll only know a snippet about it. So, yeah, a true, a true wonder of the scientific world. Um, yeah, yeah just, just thank you so much for the talk this evening. Um, I'm sure from everybody here tonight, we really, really appreciate your in-depth answers and just your enthusiasm for the, for the subject. Um, and I wish you all the best with all the future projects and future discoveries. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully one day you can come down and map Penwith with us or something like that. Have well, a good see, fun. There, there is a, a big lottery scheme, the, that Penwith Landscape Partnership. So it's, it's received over a million pounds. And I can't believe that they haven't integrated a, a LIDAR element to it. it, it oh. And it's only just it only in the past sort of year been, been started. I, I find it incredible. Right, there we go. Let that be known. That'll be on yeah. YouTube now. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. All right. Well, um, yeah, I'll let you enjoy the rest of your evening. So thank you, Chris, and uh, hopefully catch up with you again. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.